So welcome to the traditional Ask Me Anything AMA uh, with the Postgres community. Uh, we're fortunate to be joined by four wonderful panelists this year. Uh, first, briefly, we're going to do some introductions. I'm Jonathan Katz. I'm a member of the core team. I am the least technically qualified person on the core team, but that's why they have me host the AMA panel. So I'm going to let uh, these panelists introduce themselves. They'll tell a little bit about who they are, what they do, and uh, maybe a fun fact about themselves. Hi, my name is Mark Wong. I, uh, let's see, what do I do? Um, this is softball. <laughs> yeah, so I, I help out on the uh, United States Postgres Association. Um, uh, sometimes I speak, sometimes I organize things, um, sometimes I, I help exhibit. Um, once upon a time I help uh, do database benchmarking system characterization stuff and uh, I'm from Portland, Oregon. I, th I think you missed the fact that you're the one who's coordinating the Postgres presence right here at scale, right? So that's also him. <laughs> okay, no one wants to claim credit for that one. We'll, we'll see what it takes for that one. So, uh, hi, my name is uh, Magnus Hagender. Uh, along with uh, Jonathan, I'm on the Postgres core team. I'm also one of the committers on the code base, even though I don't do as much development on the code itself as I used to do. Uh, I work as a, uh, leading the Postgres consultancy efforts for a company in the Scandinavia called Red Bull Impro. Uh, so I'm out of Stockholm, not Oregon, but Sweden instead. <coughs> uh, and I'm also uh, currently the president of the board for Postgres Europe, which is sort of what Mark does except over in Europe. Nice to meet you. So my name is Tom Lane. Uh, uh, <laughs> Not. I'm Devrim, Devrim Gindes, so I, uh, I'm one of the major contributors to the project. I built RPMs uh, for many platforms. I mean the upstream uh, RPMs, the Postgres.org uh, RPMs. Uh, the reason I started using Postgres was in 1998, the MySQL RPM didn't work on Reddit 6 point something. So, at that time, I switched to another database called Postgres, something hard to pronounce anyway. So now I'm making my life by building the RPMs. Hi, I'm Joe Conway. Uh, I've been using Postgres since 98. Also, one of the committers, um, also run, uh, you know, manage the, uh, the team of uh, Postgres con contributors at Amazon. Uh, I'll give you two fun facts. One, um, not the most complicated feature I wrote, but the one that is probably the most used is generate series. So if you use that, I assume just about everyone has. Um, that was something I wrote because like someone posted to the list years ago and said, it'd be really cool if we could do this. And I was like, oh yeah, that's easy. So it, it was, it, small thing turns out to be really useful. Um, other fun fact is uh, I started my career as a nuclear submariner. As a nuclear submarine. <laughs> a submariner, okay. Which I have a fun fact for you. Tomorrow I have a talk where I use generate series in it. So this is the AMA, um, ask me anything. We like to ask questions about you know, topics around Postgres, open source Postgres, and it's supposed to be you know, you know, a light fun session you know, one of the highlights of the event because, you know, you can just ask these folks anything and, you know, like all the, you know, LLMs out there, they know the answer to everything and if not, they will try to answer it to the best of their abilities. So, like, in that spirit of, you know, open source, I have an open source question for you. How did you get started contributing to Postgres? Let's start with you, Joe. Okay, another um, fun story. Um, my brother-in-law was asked by a friend of his to write basically a database application to track projects. This is, again, back in 1998. And I said, oh yeah, sure, we'll, we, we can do that. We'll use SQL Server and Active Server pages and we'll, you know, we'll create this app. And the guy was like, no, we're not using any of that Microsoft stuff. We're gonna use something called Red Hat Linux and database called Postgres. And I was like, okay, never heard of either of those things, but I'm game, so that was kind of how I got started using Postgres, and I immediately started figuring out there were things that it couldn't do that I wanted it to do, and I just kind of started 
hacking and sending stuff to the list. And uh, I guess another fun fact, the first time I posted to the list, Jan Veek told me that's a stupid thing to want to do. So don't, don't feel bad if you go to the Postgres list and someone tells you this, that's a stupid thing because it's just... Um, and, and that's how we got Generate Series. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it was 2000 when we had techdocs.postgresql.org where lots of outdated documents were over there. And I use it a lot. And I contacted to Justin Clift and uh, saying I want to mirror this thing and update this thing. And I, he introduced me to the community, um, like Dave and Magnus and etc. I think in 2005, um, I started building my, my own RPMs and shared on my website. And suddenly people started using it. <laughs> then I realized, realized that it would be good to contribute to the community. And yeah, this is how I actually started contributing to the community in both the Tech Talks website and RPMs. Yeah, I think my first, actually my second, but my first larger contribution to Postgres was in the world of porting, uh, which is I ported the client side library to run on Windows. Because you know, back in those days, anything you did at work had to work on Windows. But I could sneak in the Postgres server running on things that weren't Windows. But people would notice if I replaced all the desktop machines uh, for all the users with something other than Windows. So I had to port the, uh, the libpq as it is the C driver to build and run on Windows. Uh, ironically enough, my very first patch in Postgres, which I was not actually credited for, but you know, I still claim that was it, uh, was to make Postgres build on Linux because all the other developers were using BSD. <laughs> so I kind of did lots of porting stuff there, but that's uh, the two first ones for me. Mark? So for me, well, once upon a time, I worked at this uh, little startup that w called Sequin that was doing um, one, I think, I think I can say it was one of the pioneers in parallel computing. Um, and I was doing TPC benchmarks, if folks are familiar with those uh, database benchmarks. So then along came a company called IBM that bought up Sequin. And, um, at the same time, a little uh, nonprofit called the Open Source Development Labs, which I think everyone knows now as the Linux Foundation, um, worked out a deal with IBM and said, "Hey, uh, we needed, we, we want to know if if uh, open source can really compete in in this TPC arena." So um, I was one of the folks that went over there and implemented an open well, not implemented the stack, but but took what we knew how to, uh, took, an, took a TPC benchmark and said, we're gonna run up against this open source stack and, and Postgres was one of the databases we decided to try out. So I uh, dumped a whole bunch of data on one of the mailing lists and said, hey, do you guys care about how this looks when I run a TPCC and stuff on, on this? And a few people responded and were happy to look at the things I was um, shelling out Awesome. So now we've heard your origin stories. And before I you know, flip it over to the audience, let's fast forward to today. There's obviously been a lot of development in Postgres since you know, the late 90s, early 2000s, and a lot of new features in there. So what are some of the, you know, what's one recent feature or recent, you know, even like work group in Postgres that you, know, you really like? I, I need a moment to think. I'll, I'll, I'll. Uh, well, I've got a whole talk about new features tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> that's the plug. I get to do that one, right? I'll, I'll sing a lot one of those to say the reason once I was, because I was going through them all the past couple of weeks. Um, but I think it shows also an interesting uh, move. There are a bunch of optimizations that have been put in that if you actually look at the submissions when they come in first, it's like, why would you want that? You can just fix your query. Like, it's easy to fix these queries to not do stupid things. Uh, but then we realized that today, loads of the queries that we run on our databases, we didn't write them ourselves, did we? They were written by an ORM or some other query generation tool. Uh, and we got some interesting things that are simply looking at, like, uh, there are two things I'd highlight in that particular. There's a self-join removal patch that's in. That's basically when you accidentally join the table to itself, and you didn't really have to do that. Um, 
the system will detect that and just not do the join and just select it all once. Uh, and the other one is an optimization around using uh, not nulls, where your columns are defined as not nulls, and you query the table with a where clause that either checks that it is null or that it is not null. We don't actually have to run that where clause. Uh, and as of the upcoming Postgres version 17, we actually will not do that uh, anymore. So uh, I think that just the general move in that direction of trying to fix badly written queries instead of just punting it to the, to the user to tell them to fix it, uh, I think that's a, a good move and a good direction that we're seeing Postgres going. Yes. If you're lucky, I will have researched that by my talk tomorrow. I don't know the answer right now, sorry. Deborah? Thank you. So I'm not a hacker. I never contributed to the core Postgres, but the most, the, one of the pages that I liked was removal of money type, and it didn't go through. So that's what I can say. Never give up. Never give up. Yeah. Submit it again. <laughs> so I think <clears throat> Top of mind for me is um, going into 17, Jeff Davis just committed a built-in coalition provider. And you act like I haven't done that And my talk tomorrow is on why that's a really good thing. Well, actually, I won't talk about his patch tomorrow, but uh, my talk tomorrow will convince you that the fact that he committed this is a really good thing. You should talk about his patch. There's still time to write the talk. Yep. So, so, so just one more thing, you know, before opening it up, Magnus. I have written queries explicitly as a human that have something is not null. To be clear. Oh yeah, but did you have it when the table made it clear that this would never happen? To be determined, probably, because I was an app developer. But well, Mark, do you, do you have a feature? I, I do always like these uh, new stats tables that show up that give us some insight into more of what the um, databases actually think it's doing. Like the what the most recent one is the IO stats, right? Yeah, if you count the yeah. ones that have been released, yes. Yes, yeah, pgstat.io is awesome. All right, let's hear your questions. So please raise your hand and I will run over to you with the mic to answer the question. And there's already one in the back. Please follow the pattern, run in the back, run in the back. Yeah, make me, yeah, make me exercise. <laughs> All right, so, um, so I'm Tim Stewart, by the way. Um, so I have two questions. Um, the first one, so let me back up a little bit. So. The majority of my experience is Oracle. So I spent like 25 years in the Oracle space, and then the last seven in the Postgres space. So the first question is on features. So how exactly do you decide which features will go? Ah, yes. All right, so the question is on features, right? So how do you decide which features are gonna go into a particular release, right? Because when I look at it from two perspectives, there are features that may be from the business perspective and then a user perspective, right? So how do you make the decision on what new features you're gonna add? Thank you, Tim. I can watch me exercise because I don't do enough of it. Who wants it? So it's interesting, as, as you claim, so for the Postgres side, first of all, there is not really a business perspective, right? There is no, no business in that regard. Um, so we have the user perspective is really the only one that we have. Uh, but I guess one way to look at the business perspective would be who actually builds the features, right? And in particular, we haven't even, as you would notice um, if you go through my talk tomorrow, you'll know we don't even know yet what will be in the next version, even though we are three weeks or so away from the feature freeze. And we don't know uh, what we 
do is basically whatever people contribute <laughs> and manage to you know, get enough reviewers uh, to believe that it's going to be stable in time, um, it will get added. So you won't find a, a, like a roadmap for Postgres even within one release. Right? When we released Postgres 16, the Postgres project had no idea what was going to go into 17. Obviously, a bunch of Postgres developers knew what they were going to work on. A bunch of the companies employing these developers knew what they were going to assign their people to work on uh, and things like that. But at the whole project, it, it really does go by, uh, we have these things we call commit fest, which is just the, the iterative development style we use. Um, and you get your patches in and you get them reviewed. And if they've reached enough quality, they get included. Uh, Otherwise not, that's basically it. Obviously there are cases where the, the senior developer community will basically say we don't actually want this. Like people do build things that we don't want, but that is very uncommon in general. So in general it, it really goes by the, if, if you get it done and you manage to get people interested enough to get reviews, then it gets in. Like we don't, we never, we would never do things like, oh, we'll postpone that to the next version because we have so many other good features in this version that you know it'll ruin our PR. Uh, we'll put everything in and we'll make it harder for people like Jonathan, who has to write our press releases, to decide what he's actually going to write, uh, as long as it's ready and as long as we believe uh, that the current version is going to be uh, of this feature is going to be stable enough. Anyone want to add something? So for us, generally better to have more features because it helps the press release. Uh, I am not worried about uh, too many features. But let's say, you know, you, you talked a little bit about the process. Um, so let's say you do have an idea for a feature. Like, what's a, you know, what's a way for me to be able to take that idea and make it a reality to get it committed to Postgres? Because this is what I see on the mailing list. So one of the uh, mistakes that some people do, uh, as far as I... Uh, I can see is they, the first email con contains a patch. Um, so first, what should be done was write your, write your ideas, write the outline, what you want to do, what, what I mean, is, 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 if, which feature is, is going to solve some of that problem or not. And then ask support or ask opinions from other hackers or other people, then start developing the patch. Um, so probably that would be much better than sending the code in the first place, unless you're a ex 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 great hacker, you know what you are doing, and et cetera. Um, yeah. I'll just add that we do have the problem sometimes is when people send in just the patch first. Yeah, they're going to get the reply saying, hey, you should have discussed the architecture first. And then someone sends in the discussion with the architecture first, and then they get the reply, hey, but where's your proof of concept patch? So like, it does go both ways. But yes, in general, discussing the general idea first is, is the right one. I'll just add, in terms of getting something kind of across the finish line, you not only need to get people interested enough to review it, you generally need to get one of the committers interested enough to like actually carry the ball across the, the line. And we've, we've got a limited number of committers, there's 30 committers right now. And in order for something to actually get into the code base, one of those committers has to be willing to literally carry that ball across the finish line. Um, and, and that's kind of a bar because as a committer, if you've committed something the rest of the committers will expect that you'll go back and fix any problems related with that thing. So you're kind of giving yourself a future task if you, if you carry something across the line. So it is, that's kind of one of the bars that you still have to meet. And now I understand why my patches have not been committed for good reason. Questions? As contributors to the project, would you feel that having an issue tracker or a bug tracker would make your lives easier in any way? The, the hard-hitting questions. Who wants it? Because you asked as a contributor to the project. No. As a user of the project, yes. Do you, you want to expand on that? <laughs> I can expand on that if you want to. I, I, 
I do think as a contributor, no, it, it really wouldn't help me. Uh, once I've gotten to the point that I want to contribute something, like I, the problem isn't that I can't go figure if someone else contributed it already, because a Google search will find that for me, right? Um, as a user of the project, it would be more useful to go see like when are things actually fixed, where, like which version has what, like all of that stuff. It would bring much more value to me in that role uh, than it would to me as a contributor. Uh, that reminds me of something. Actually, there is an issue tracker which is called Magnus because every time there, every time there, there, every time there is a bug about the RPMs, he sends me a message on Telegram, gives me the number, and says, "Go and fix it. Go and fix it." So, <laughs> thank you. He's my bug. But I've also noticed, you know, there's, you know, I think there are some issue trackers in the community. I know the, you know, the RPM project has one, but also, you know, extensions, right? Because you see a lot of the extensions to Postgres, they're not in the core code, you know, they may have their own trackers. Which kind of leads me to a question, since we're on this topic, what's a way for, to be, that the Postgres project can better support extension developers for writing their extensions? Well, I think certainly part of that would be things like what are planned for um, pgconf.dev this year where we have an actual workshop scheduled for dev hackers to help people who are trying to learn how to get into Postgres development as well as a whole track, like a half day on extension development, right? So those are two, I think, very valuable things it's definitely um, it, it's it's a tricky landscape because the the amount of complexity when you start looking at the total number of extensions is is pretty high. But uh, at, one of the things I've pointed to many times over the years, and you've probably heard me say this, there are other projects like the R project where they have a bit more automated infrastructure. So, as an extension developer to R, you upload something and it automatically gets smoke tested. And basically, it doesn't get exposed on their CRAN, which is how they distribute the extensions. It's not like visible to the world unless it passes those basic tests. Does it have a regression test? Does it pass the regression test? Does it have documentation, et cetera? So I could see where something like that would be really valuable for the Postgres community and the extension community in, around Postgres. I do not want to personally volunteer myself to go write that. <laughs> yeah, I was actually going into that earlier. I think that's more, that's not really for creating and developing the extensions, but for distributing them where there is, there's currently no central Postgres registry for, for extensions. There have been a few different attempts throughout the years, and in, in my view, none of them have solved the actual problems which is, for example, integration with the RPM packaging world, with the Debian packaging world, with the Windows packaging world. Like, You want these things to integrate in those, and combining that with an interface like the one Joe talks about with, you know, you can only get through if you have all the tests and all that, and, and getting all that automated into some sort of a registry would, I think, help a lot uh, to many. But like Joe, uh, I'm not volunteering to do that. Um, I, I, think that I'm sorry, I think this will be addressed in the next few month, well, maybe years, because a few people actually started working on a new um, extension ecosystem, and we may hear some updates for, uh, after, after PGConf dev, so we'll see. So there's a question is, how many extensions are there? <laughs> it's easily... So there's a website that was called like a thousand Postgres extensions or GitHub page, which shows over a thousand. I've seen estimates as high as twenty thousand. I don't know if that is, you know, how true those estimates are, but it's certainly a lot because there's the open source extensions, and then there's commercial extensions, and then there's probably people's personal extensions that we never see. And I think that's you know one one of you know one of the interesting design points about Postgres is that it's designed to be extensible. You can just add functionality without having to fork the code or get you know these folks to to commit it. Yep, I see. Oh. <coughs> yeah. 
with not self-joining in mind, what interest is there in sort of creating more guardrails for PostgreSQL and how do you go about deciding, okay, this is too controlling? One of the things I've encountered a lot of is developers accidentally creating Cartesian products with ORMs. So I'm thinking on that lines. I have definitely created Cartesian projects on my own. I know of at least one extension that will detect when you do that and throw an error. <laughs> so these things can also be done in extensions, uh, just like the other classic is, you know, you do delete and you forget the where clause. Uh, like, who, who's ever not done that? <laughs> uh, and the question is more who did that on an important production database? And, and, you know, there's probably enough of us who've done that too and, and really blessed the fact that we had rollback. Uh, but it's still pretty bad for performance. So. Um, I don't know, there, it has been that one, I think the one that's most often proposed is, you know, disallow delete without a where clause, and the general project approach has been that that is not our job, uh, but, and especially since it can be done in an extension, like you can have an extension that basically looks over the query tree and goes like, this node is not allowed here. Um, for the simple things, you can disallow a Cartesian product. More complicated things are obviously, you, you can do it because the extension will have access to all the information, but it, it can become very complicated. Uh, but I think the general view from the project is, is basically uh, that no. <laughs> uh, we leave that to extensions. I, I think one of the things that's been discussed recently in the community, and I don't think it's going to get into 17, but there's been more and more discussions about uh, things around resource management in Postgres. And so when it comes to guardrails, you know, we may not disallow specific queries, but if, if there's like guardrails around using too much memory and, and not having your database, you know, OOM killed, um, that'll help a lot. And, and there are other ways you can do that. I've, I actually have an extension, you know, that can do some resource management if you're willing to use secret version two. And if you want to hear about that, I could probably bend your ear for hours. But um, I, I think there's a lot of possibilities for how we can do those things. And a lot of times the answer isn't, you know, disallow Cartesian joins. I've actually written Cartesian joins on purpose for legitimate reasons. So, <laughs> okay, going back to extensions, I mean, I think also the great thing about the commit fest stuff is that there's a lot of code review going on. But, okay, there maybe there are some extensions like the Cartesian product thing that Postgres will not accept in core, but then there are certainly thousands that in theory Postgres would accept in core. How is there a way that um, code review, code quality can be still maintained? Do you have some ideas how that would work? Is it all up to the extension people or should there be some general more realistic review from the Postgres community? Should they all be in contrib? Is there, is there any thoughts on that? They should absolutely not be in contrib, and contrib should be burned in fire and destroyed. Um, I think, but I think also, like, yeah, no, it, they, uh, like, any code review, as you say, it should not be done by the general developer community. It shouldn't be required to be done by the general community because one of the great things about the extensions is that it doesn't have to be, right? Because that is a very limited resource. Um, from from a contributor point or a reviewer. Uh, perspective, right? It's, uh, if we required somehow, how, however that would work, all extensions to be reviewed by, you know, a, a Postgres committer or whatever, right? Then we would slow down extension development drastically. Uh, and I don't know how in a reasonable way, like, can we require, like, if you have one of these upcoming regis new registries for extensions, you require code review? I don't even know how that would work. Uh, I think in the end, that's something that comes down to each individual extension developers, right? Okay, look, we have massive extensions like PostGIS, which has many developers with lots of great code review, and then we have lots of extensions that just have one developer who spent three hours throwing together a block of Cartesian joins, and, and like once it's there, <laughs> <laughs> right? So yeah, I, I, it would be interesting to find a way to do some sort of like quality 
stamp on extensions that have reached a certain level, but I don't know how. I would just add, I think some of that is a bit self-regulating. You know, something that's poorly written probably doesn't get popular in the first place. Um, things that are poorly written, I think, become evident pretty quickly. Of course, if you're not all that familiar with the Postgres community, and you go kind of Google and find some extension, you may not realize it. So I, it would be valuable if there was a way to have, you know, a, a vetting of these things. But um, I mean, in some way, GitHub sort of does that with stars and people following it. So if you can see something's popular, at least that's one indicator that maybe a lot of people are using it, and therefore it's a little bit more stable. But in, in general, it really is kind of the usage. If a lot of people are using something, it tends to be more stable because the bugs get found and fixed. And conversely, if the bugs are not getting fixed, you won't find that a lot of people are using something. So, I mean, that's not a perfect answer, but as Magnus points out, we can't really kind of funnel everything through the small number of people that are involved in the core engine development either. I don't think that's, easy. I don't think that's a good solution either. Yeah, then they're not really extensions anymore. And I think if, my, if I remember correctly, only one extension made into the core in the last 15 years, T-Search 2. Do we have any other extensions that actually went, went through the core? A function from PG Crypto, Jen Randall, UID. Yeah, and just maybe two or three. Uh, I, mean, I think there are other examples, but uh, T-Search was an extension, but it was an extension in Contrib, which is this weird halfway, somewhere in between kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know about extensions. There are other features that have existed as a completely external extension, but they have really all the time been targeted at being included, so very few people really use them um, as an extension, I think. Uh, there were extension things around the JSON stuff before it got in, uh, but they were more used as a way to build proof of concepts. Uh, which is another good use case for extensions, right? If, if you can build it as an extension, people can test it out and then you can, can merge it in. So, uh, yeah, it's tricky because the fact that extensions aren't controlled is also one of the things that let them, you know, develop into things that nobody had thought of before. I heard someone say it out there. Doesn't the logical replication stuff count as a oh, yeah. something proof of concept that, well, if, if I okay to put it that way, it was a proof of concept as an extension that was being re-implemented, I think. I need music when I'm running. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hi. Uh, so, I know how to report the bugs if I find some, so I know that. However, I have lots of asks, as everybody knows, right? I have a long list of asks what I would like to have in Postgres. So each time I talk about this ask, you know, like Robert Haas, who does not hate me at all, he's saying, Hetty, I have another 120 features, why I should like, care about what you want. I, and I only have six years left until retirement, okay? I, uh, back to say, I know what you think. I'm not working after retirement. I know what you think. I'm not. Uh, so how I can make my voice, I know my voice is loud, but how I can, <laughs> how I can like, make some of my asks more, like, you know, addressed. Bribe a developer with cookies? <laughs> or, or, in, or, I mean, in this case, maybe Robert. If you <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, fun, fundamentally, it's like, yeah, fine. If, if, you, if you're in a position to write them yourself, write them yourself. If you're not in a position to write them yourself, yeah, uh, but but more like generically. Like otherwise, uh, you have to find a way to convince somebody to work on them, right? And one way is to bribe them with cookies. Uh, and uh, another one is to employ them and tell them what to do. Like there, there are those kinds of things. I think, in general, I mean that's one of the differences, right? In uh, if all the developers are in the same company, 
you can find a manager to tell them what to do, right? And tell them to work on this project and explain to your company why your thing is more important. In the open source world, you just have to convince the developers of that without having a manager to convince on the way, which may be harder or easier depending on, uh, on what it is. But in the end, the only way to get things higher up on a developer's to-do list is to either make them interested in it for, from their own sake or to find a way to directly or indirectly fund their work. That, I think those are the only ways. So I, th I think Magnus is getting cookies. <laughs> so I, I, I so so I think the other part of the answer to your question is, and again, maybe not the perfect answer, but it, it's basically the Postgres community answer is. You, you need to like show up at the major Postgres conferences, find one of the developers and you like, well, get them to listen to you long enough about your idea and, and convince them that it's an interesting thing that they should care about. <laughs> no, I, I mean, seriously, I, I've talked to people over the years about like PGCon and the value to me at P, of going to PGCon over the years was not attending the talks, it was attending the, the after talk event at the Dubliner where you sit around the table with a dozen hackers and, you know, and, and just people talk about, well, this is you know, this interesting thing or that interesting thing. Over the years, so many of the features that are in Postgres today, I first heard about at the table at the Dubliner or at the, you know, what was it, the Royal Oak or whatever it was called. Um, with a bunch of hackers who were just sitting around for hours and hours after the conference talking about database nerd stuff, right? So that's the way Postgres gets done. So. Yep, so you, so you write the ask on an index card, you put a cookie on top of it, you hand it to Magnus, and there you go. That starts the process. Actually, I want to I wanna build on Joe's point, because I think you know, this is an important part of the Postgres community. And it's not just you know, going out to the different after events, it's the hallway track, because a lot of discussions and ideas are taught there. It's not just about making contributions, it's learning how Postgres works. So uh, this reminds me of a story, because I see Chris here, and I'm going to put Chris on the spot. We were at PeachyCon one time, it was before Postgres 12 came out. And you know, as mentioned, like one of my jobs in the community is to try to take the what's the release notes and turn into a release announcement. And there was something in there about like, oh, you know, your you know, your client can specify like using a certificate to do a full username verification. And I'm reading this, I thought nothing of it. And you know, I'm mentioning this to I, I forgot how it came up. Like Chris and I were chatting in the hallway, and Chris was like, this is actually the first piece of two-factor authentication Postgres has because what you can do is you can do password auth and then force the client to prevent, present a valid certificate with a username on it. Therefore, there's two factors of authentication that go through. And that, that was the light bulb moment because we were standing in a hallway track between a talk, you know, talking about upcoming features. And it's like, oh, wow, this is a great security feature. I think that made its way into the, the general release announcement. So that's a lot of the value of just you know, going around talking to folks in the community because we learn, we understand, and like we can help either build new features or articulate them. Questions? Yeah, that, 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 that was news to me today. Questions? I have a silly question. Okay. So we heard your favorite new feature. What's your least favorite old feature? So the question is, what is your least favorite old feature? Old feature. How, how old? Let's clarify, like ten, more than 10 years old, 20 years old? More than 10. Money. I'd say my, my least favorite 
old feature would be the fact that there's an 8K page limitation for indexes. Yeah, I can, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll take the money data type then. Because <laughs> that is bullshit. Yeah. If you're using it, stop using it. It's not good for anything. Yes. The only thing it actually does that is not solved by other things, it does that, like, destructively. Don't ever use the money data type. So I know there's going to be a follow-up question to that, but I'm not going to be the one to ask it. I know there's a patch proposed to remove it for 17, but... So actually, I have, I have a question. So as you know, I, I probably made clear today, I started as an app developer. Like I came to the community as an app developer who just like loved working with the database. So. You know, I think a common question amongst app developers, well, maybe it should be a question, common question amongst app developers is like, okay, I built this app, and it's using Postgres, I'm ready to go to production. What would be something you tell that app developer about running Postgres in production? Like, what things do they need to do? Uh, you may be thinking I'm joking, but my first thing should be get a DBA and tune your database. I'll double down on that. <coughs> what does a DBA do to tune my data? Well, the, 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 you, the main thing you need to do is make sure your database is actually properly designed from the first place. <coughs> Most of the performance problems I've run into over the years doing consulting, helping people support, most of it is caused by poor database design. Wrong data types, mismatched data types, poorly laid out tables, not normalized. Index on every column. Oh, yeah. And twice. twice yeah, yeah I, I've seen databases where, because of the way they design things, they had an index on column A, an index on column A and B, A, B, and C, A, B, C, and D, yeah. out to like 16 columns, right? And, you, and then you go, you tell them, look, let's look at how many of these have actually been used. And, like, I know this is like 15 years ago, but they had a 500 gig database, and I showed them if they just dropped the indexes that have never been touched, their database would have been 100 gigs. I'll add one more if you insist on going to production without talking to DDBA first. At least get real backups, not just PG dumps. And even, even if it's PG dumps, that's better than nothing at all. I don't like trying to recover databases from corrupt file systems when there are no backups at all. So please don't do that. Or do that so that we can make more money. No, no I, I like to make money different ways. <laughs> that, by the way, I was trying to prompt that, that discussion. Yeah, and I think that that's, you know, Magnus brings up a good point about backups. You know, I think a lot of people focus on availability, which of course is important, right? You want to make sure your data is always available. But you really want to have those backups for a bad day in case you, you know, there's you know, the, you know, the dreaded my user table drop. I need to restore it. But also, just in general, it's good for other purposes too, like you know, restoring test environments and you know, doing uh, work around that. And don't make them shroding your backups. If you haven't restored it, you don't know whether it's any good. So we're starting to get short on time. Um, this, we probably have time for one more question, maybe two. Can you expand why you hate the 8K limitation on indexes? And can that be turned into a feature? Uh, can you explain why you don't like the 8K page limit on indexes? Uh, uh, no, I, Jonathan actually recently discovered this. Um, because when you're trying to index something that is inherently large, once that thing is larger than 8K, you can no longer build an index on it. 
Yeah. Well, not just if it's a B tree, it, it, unless you have built specific support for it. So the, the specific example is the vector data type stuff, right, which is very popular these days. And they want to get them bigger and bigger and bigger. And so without some additional hacking, that's not, it's not possible to support over, well, right now, so right now PG vector is using four byte floats. So it can support something, I think, just shy of 2,000 dimensions. Yeah. So if you, but people are starting to push those things where they want much larger dimensional vectors. So, and that's, it's not possible currently to index that. Without shrinking. Or without shrinking it through quantization or something. Okay, I think we might have time for one more, maybe two more. So a Postgres user asked me the other day, and I said, I'll ask the developers next week. So when you, we have a multiple column index, and the second column is of low cardinality, but is not included in the where clause, why don't we use the index? Okay, so there's, there's a clarification, I think. Okay, so we have a, uh, an index on two columns, and we only specify the where clause for the wrong column. So the index doesn't get used. If the cardinality is low enough that we could afford to use the index uh, to fulfill the query, why don't we? I think that's basically the feature often referred to as index skip scans, right? Uh, and I think the reason why we're not doing it is that nobody has completed the patch yet. As in, I think I've actually seen some years ago a start attempt at a patch. Um, so I, I don't think there's a fundamental reason we're not doing it. I just think it hasn't been done yet. So, I can this. so there's a feature going to Postgres 17 that's going to have the underpinnings to be able to do this. Um, it's basically the, the prelude to skip scan. Coming soon, maybe. We'll see tomorrow. At Magnus's talk. What time is your talk? Okay, very good. All right, let's see. We could probably do one. We probably do one more question before we close out. If you have a burning question that you've always wanted answered by a Postgres expert, or one pretending to be one in this panel. All right. I see. It. Tim, going to close this out by making me run all the way. No, it's okay. I can right. come to you. This is this is. Well, this is, this come is, back. This is, <laughs> no, so, all right. We're, we're, we're full service here. So, where do you see Postgres in five years? That was gonna be my question. Very good question. You Thank you. Yeah. Oh well. All right. Gotta get the music going. Do 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 do. It'll be that much closer to dominating the database market. Almost approaching feature fees for Postgres 22. <laughs> um, in the next five years, uh, five years later, it will be 15 years before what Simon said in the keynote about that we will dominate the world. So five years later, it's 15 years left for the domination. I think as long as we continue the way we've been doing things recently, I think Postgres will be continuing to thrive and grow um, and um, be used more and more for different use cases than it is today, you know? All right, I'm going to give a less visionary answer. I think there's been a lot of work going on in Postgres lately that's going to help with the vertical scale, so being able to continue to use more and more of the hardware resources available and horizontal and distributed scale. Um, Vertical scale, I think about the direct I.O. work, just being able to you know, directly work with things at the storage level. And then I think about the logical replication work going on in terms of the horizontal level. And there's, like, and there's other projects as well, right? Like I'm picking on two that I have at least some glancing familiarity at. But you know, I, think that's, I think that's what we're going to see is that as these workloads continue to grow, Postgres will be able to rise and be able to take on more and more of them. 
And with that, we are at time. I would like to thank our esteemed group of panelists here. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs>